It's one of the most intriguing locations in the world. Covered in darkness and miles underwater, this extreme environment is home to some unusual creatures and phenomena. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. No wonder it's been so difficult to explore. Because of the risky conditions, people aren't able to explore this location without proper equipment. But what would happen if we threw a steel ball down there? Let's start with some basics. How did they first discover this enormously deep hole in the ocean? HMS Challenger identified it back in 1875. The ship had some pretty fancy sounding equipment for its time, but it wasn't nearly good enough to be able to fully explore the trench. Some decades later, in 1951, another ship, the HMS Challenger II, came back to the location better equipped. The vessel featured an echo sounder and was able to take accurate measurements of what seemed to be the deepest point on the surface of our planet. If you were to look at it in 2D, you'd see the trench measures 1,500 miles in length and 43 miles in width on average. It also looks sort of like a crescent-shaped scar when you observe it from above. Nothing out of the ordinary so far, right? Well, if you were to stretch a wire from the surface of the ocean to the trench's deepest point, it would measure a staggering seven miles. If we were able to physically move Mount Everest, which is the Earth's tallest mountain, to cover the Mariana Trench, it still wouldn't be enough, falling short by about a mile. Because the Mariana Trench is so deep, it's almost completely covered in darkness, as light can barely get through to such extreme distances underwater. The temperature isn't any friendlier either, just a few degrees above freezing. But the most dangerous feature of them all is the water pressure. Right at the deepest point of the trench, the amount of pressure is about a thousand times higher than the standard atmospheric pressure. Not a lot of people ever attempted to descend into the Mariana Trench. In fact, the first organized attempt took place more than 60 years ago. It was done by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in a submersible. They only spent about five hours on their descent and a mere 20 minutes at the bottom. Alas, they weren't able to take any pictures. Until these two scientists were able to descend, specialists believed there was little to no chance that life could exist down there, given the conditions, most notably the extreme pressure. But while at the bottom, the submersible's floodlight caught sight of a creature. It was a very flat one indeed. As you can imagine, resources here are very scarce. What kind of creatures live down here? And how do they survive, given the harsh environment? Surprisingly, there is quite an abundance of wildlife living in the Mariana Trench. Some of these creatures fall back on chemicals to survive, like methane or sulfur, while other kinds of fish nibble at the marine life that's, well, weaker than them on the food chain. The most common creatures found here are xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. Some of them adapted by hardening up their shell using aluminum harnessed from the seawater. Smaller creatures, like microbes, adapted by feeding on the chemicals emitted when the seawater hits the underwater rocks. They consider the Mariana snailfish the rock star of the area in terms of wildlife. They're small, ranging from three to nine inches, translucent and lacking any scales, but they're the top beast of prey in the area. It's no wonder some people started to believe that the ancient megalodon might still be living here. What was a megalodon, you might be wondering? It was the largest predator ever known in our planet's history. Basically, the biggest and nastiest shark ever to have lived. Scientists believe it's been extinct for quite some time, and the idea that it might still be hiding in the Mariana Trench doesn't have a lot of supporting information. The megalodon would have needed to learn to navigate in complete darkness. It would either have to be bioluminescent or evolve to have massive eyes. More so, because of its school bus-like size, the megalodon would have needed a lot to eat. Microbes and small snailfish just wouldn't have done the trick. If a steel ball were to be dropped in the trench, what would be its effect on it? Would the ball be strong enough to sustain such pressure? Let's look at the science here. If we assume it's a solid steel ball, the pressure found at the bottom of the trench wouldn't be enough to really affect it and cause permanent damage. It would take it a solid 12 minutes to reach the bottom of the ocean, though. What about the temperature? Well, 
It turns out that the difference in temperature on the surface and at the bottom of the trench is quite impressive, a difference of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it would cause the ball to shrink a bit, but yet again, once the ball returns to the surface, it would simply come back to normal. Should the ball get stuck there, there's another interesting question to answer. Would corrosion affect it? Corrosion of steel is highly dependent on the amount of oxygen in the water. The amount of oxygen dissolved in water remains constant at depths greater than 3 miles. I'll spare you the math, but it would take more than 10,000 years for the steel ball to completely rust under the sea. I can't help but wonder though, what would it take us humans to be able to survive at such extreme depths? Let's look at what was used in the past to explore this mysterious location. A little thing called syntactic foam. Why? Because it's the only material that can both float and resist the amount of pressure found here. Without this sort of protection, our lungs would rapidly collapse here. More so, the pressure from the water would push liquid into our mouths, replacing the much needed oxygen with water. Then, there would be the much needed ability to be able to come back to the surface should anything not go as planned. One of the vessels that went for a deep dive here had 1,000 pound steel weights attached to it so it would ensure its sinkage. These weights were connected to the ship by a special type of wire that had an increased corroding time of 11 to 13 hours in seawater, just in case something went wrong down there and they'd have to bounce back faster. Given the harsh conditions here, the problem of oxygen supply is really important too. Any vessel looking to descend into the Mariana Trench again would need to consider some sort of device that can recycle the air in order to reduce the amount of oxygen that needs to be transported down there. And the last, but definitely not the least of all problems, would be electricity. There surely isn't a power socket down there for you to charge your phone. So, there needs to be enough battery life to support all the necessary equipment, communication, oxygen supply, lighting devices, and so on. None of these problems seem to be quite the challenge anymore, since, as of recently, you can buy a tour of the Mariana Trench. Three lucky individuals were part of such a project back in 2020. They were submerged in a 3.5-inch thick titanium sphere. This ensured that they didn't feel any pressure changes and physiological stresses whatsoever. Each of the guests took part in an individual trip that had an estimated length of about 14 hours. The descent itself took over four hours. Once they reached the bottom, they got the chance to witness some of the most extraordinary creatures on the planet. Then it was time to start the four-hour ascent back to the surface. Can you swim? Good! Because you're going on a journey to the deepest point of the Pacific Ocean. Now put on your flippers. The very bottom of the Mariana Trench is awaiting. Now get in the water. Really? Come on! All right. One foot underwater. That's the depth you can swim with no special gear like a mask. Hey, look! Must be some tourists. Or whales. 10 feet underwater. That's a little deeper than the public pools and beaches around the United States. You can see colorful fish and even photoplankton that feed on the sun's rays. 26 feet down. This is the depth at which the foundations of the floating city of Venice in Italy stand. Builders laid columns at that depth on which they later built houses and streets. 30 feet underwater. You start to feel a lot of pressure. When you're on the surface, you're under atmospheric pressure, 15 pounds per square inch. But here, at 30 feet, that pressure is doubled. All the air pockets in your body, like your lungs or ears, begin to compress from this pressure, giving you discomfort. But no worries, your organs are soft and elastic, so you can keep diving. 40 feet underwater. Oops, you're running out of air. An average person can hold their breath for 30 to 90 seconds. The current record is an incredible 24 minutes and 37 seconds. Gasp. Okay, you'll need some diving equipment to continue your descent. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tourists dive to this depth to look at reefs and corals. You don't need special skills for that, but you can't dive any deeper without training or a license. 45 feet down. Be careful. There's sharks swimming here looking for food, like you. <laughs> 
Sometimes tourists descend to this depth in a safe cage to see the sharks up close. You're better off staying away from these predators and not attracting their attention. So make sure you're not wearing any bright and shiny jewelry. Sharks love that kind of thing. 62 feet underwater. You could see the Aquarius Reef Base Lab in Florida at this depth, if you were in Florida. It's really an entire building with rooms for exploring the seafloor, accessible through a hatch. 105 feet down. You see a strange bell hanging from a chain. People used to use these things for deep diving about 400 years ago. They'd lower a bell on chains with divers inside from a ship. There was enough air inside the bell for them to breathe. That way, they could explore sunken ships with treasures. 140 feet. At this depth, you could find an entire sunken city in Qianda Lake, China. You can still see streets, houses, and temples there. 330 feet. Whoa! You almost hit a huge blue whale. How could you miss it? These guys, the size of two train cars, usually dive to that depth. Let's listen to them sing for a while. It's beautiful. Now, let's keep going. 660 feet. This is where most of the ocean life ends. Sun rays hardly penetrate any deeper into the water. Everything below are unusual fish like this angler. They have such an unusual appearance because they have to adapt to the high pressure here. 702 feet underwater. This is the last mark where you'd see a human without diving equipment. This man holds the title of the deepest man on Earth, and he's the only one who has managed to get to this depth. The water pressure on his body here was 20 times greater than that on the surface. 985 feet. Ooh, what was that sound? Whoa, that's a submarine. That's the maximum depth they can dive to. Some of them can reach speeds of 26 miles per hour. Fun fact, an ostrich can run twice as fast, but she can't swim. 1,090 feet. Say bye to this scuba diver. You won't see them any deeper than this. The world record was set in the Red Sea. It only took the diver 12 minutes to reach this depth. But it took him a whole 15 hours to return to the surface to avoid decompression sickness. So now you get an atmospheric deep diving suit. It's completely sealed, and you won't feel the insane water pressure on your body in it. 1,454 feet. If you stuck the Empire State Building in the water, its tip would be here. And all the carpet inside of it would be wet. 2,300 feet down. The water pressure here is 70 times greater than on the surface. The flexible plastic parts of your suit can't withstand that kind of pressure. So here's some urgent delivery. It's an ultra-deep submersible. Now you can continue your dive all the way down. 2,717 feet. Here, you'd see the tip of the tallest building on Earth, the Burj Khalifa. All right, who's sinking all the tall buildings around here? 5,387 feet. This is the depth of one of the oldest and deepest lakes in the world, Lake Baikal. Its area is slightly larger than the entire country of Belgium. 8,040 feet. That's the record depth the Perdido oil platform reaches in the Gulf of Mexico. And its above-water part with three decks is almost as high as the Eiffel Tower. 11,962 feet. This is the average depth of the Atlantic Ocean. You can see a huge tube as wide as a giraffe's neck. And it just seems to be endless. True, this cable connected Europe and North America and used to serve for telegraph communications. 12,303 feet underwater. Suddenly, in the darkness, you see the outline of a ship. No way! That's the Titanic itself! The intense water pressure would crush a person at this depth. So you can only dive down to the Titanic in a submarine. 13,123 feet. Whoa! Here would be the end of the deepest mine in the world, Imponen Gold Mine in Africa. But you still have deeper places to go. Let's speed up! 20,000 feet. Here you can see the deepest debris of an old ship. The USS Johnson sank more than 70 years ago. You can still clearly see the number 557 on its bow. 26,200 feet. Here, in this total darkness, you'll find the deepest fish in the world, the Mariana snailfish. They're as long as a domestic kitten and have almost transparent skin. Their eyes are poorly developed for vision because the sunlight never reaches this deep. 
29,030 feet. If you take Mount Everest, flip it over, and stick it into the Marianas Trench, this is exactly where you'd see its tip. Even though this is the highest point on our planet, you'd still have a lot deeper to go. 35,755 feet down. Here, in the Challenger Deep, you'd still see life. You'd need a microscope for that, though. Bacteria living here feed on organic molecules, similar to oil. A little deeper? Congrats! You've touched the bottom. It's 36,070 feet deep. The pressure here is 1,071 times higher than on the surface. But you're not the first person to have been here. One of the last expeditions to the bottom of the Mariana Trench was in 2012. An American filmmaker descended here in a submarine he designed himself. But the pressure broke some of the engines, so it was hard for him to maneuver here. The sonar was also damaged, and some of the batteries drained. He was in the Challenger Deep for about 3 hours and took many pictures and videos. If you look closely at the bottom itself, you can see bubbles. It's carbon dioxide and liquid sulfur. It's freezing here because of the extreme pressure and temperature close to freezing. But there's still life here in these harsh conditions. The three microorganisms are most common here. Xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. There's so few of them because they don't have enough food down here. Usually, there's a lot of palm leaves on the ocean floor, which get there from the land. But the Mariana Trench is 124 miles from the nearest islands. So the only food here is old plankton and fish scales from the ocean's upper layers. But it needs to travel tens of thousands of feet to become food for the bottom dwellers. But can you go even lower into the crust of the Earth? Well then, you'll need to unleash your giant drill and fire up the jet engines. You're pushing another 36 miles through the Earth's crust, and here is its edge. You've entered the upper mantle. It's an ocean of hot lava, 1,800 miles deep. You have to literally swim through this, reaching the outer core, another 1,400 miles deep. Then you reach the inner core, another 755 miles, and congrats! You're at the very center of the Earth. Um, I hate to ask, but how do we get out of here? Hello, Brightsiders! Do you know where the deepest place in the world is? I think it's in the Pacific Ocean, uh, near the Philippines and Papua New Guinea. It's the famous Mariana Trench. So let's take a tape measure, a very long one, and attach its end to the boat on the surface. Now we hold our breath and jump in the water. Fish and marine animals swim by. We descend lower to the depths and into total darkness. And after several hours, we reach Challenger Deep. The tape measure shows a depth of 36,200 feet. The famous Mariana Trench is not the deepest place on Earth, as everybody thought. The Kola Super Deep Borehole, located in Murmansk region in Russia, beats it by a wide margin. And scientists have discovered something unusual and sinister there. When geologists were drilling the hole, they could reach the depth of 9 miles. And then they encountered voids. Scientists on the surface were surprised and scratched their heads and then decided to lower a microphone and dozens of other sensors in these voids. The temperature down below turned out to be 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the microphone recorded something that sounded like human groans and screams. Many people thought the scientists had been able to drill into the underworld. The shocked people up above had already begun to panic. But suddenly, an unknown creature jumped out of the drill pipe. It looked like a black goat that walked on its hind legs. Its body was shrouded in black flames. The creature got out of those deep hollows and ran off into an unknown direction. Okay, wait. These are just myths that one newspaper published on the 1st of April. It's International Joke Day, by the way. But uh, many people believed it. It made many believe the scientists working at the borehole had opened a portal to the nether. And that now, horrible, outworldly creatures were free from their imprisonment. 
But like with any myth, there's some truth to it. The deeper the scientists drilled, the higher the temperature got. At 3 miles deep, it was 160 degrees. At 4.5 miles, it was 250. And at the maximum depth of 7.5 miles, the sensors recorded a temperature of 413 degrees. One day, scientists heard a loud explosion underground. They stopped working and everyone tried to find out what caused such a loud pop. But there was seemingly nothing there. After a while, they continued drilling deeper and at the same depth, no accidents happened. The drilling began in May 1970. They passed the first 4.5 miles quite easily and it was primarily hard granite rock. It was like drilling through a hard wall. But then their drill went into softer layers and the shaft of the hole began to crumble. It was like drilling in wet sand. Every time the workers took the drill out, there was a risk that the hole would collapse under its own weight. As that eventually happened, the scientists picked a new direction to drill. And you know what's interesting? In the end, the map of the entire well looked not like a straight beam from top to bottom, but like a tree trunk which had diverged into many different routes. Nine years later, scientists reached the depth of 31,400 feet and broke the world record for the deepest borehole. By 1983, they made it another 8,000 feet deeper. After a brief pause in the work, there was an accident. A part of the drill broke away from the main body and remained in the borehole. For several months, scientists tried to extract the drill, but nothing worked, and they had to return to the depth of 4.5 miles and start all over again. The drill was divided into sections and one such unit could only last about 4 hours before it had to be replaced. In terms of depth, that was only about 32 feet of drilling. Then the drill was lifted to the surface, replaced and lowered back down. On average, the drilling speed was about 200 feet per month. That's like a 20 story building. In 1990, 20 years after the work had begun, scientists reached the final depth of 40,230 feet. That's like 100 soccer fields down. And after another accident, the work stopped. Guinness World Records registered the Kola Super Deep Borehole as the deepest borehole in the world. It's like Mount Everest plus nine Empire State Buildings on top of it. One of the most unusual discoveries at the Kola Super Deep Borehole was that the soil at the depth of about two miles almost perfectly matches the composition of the surface of the moon. It has given us more insight into how our ancient satellite appeared and formed. It seems that in the early stages of Earth's formation, a giant asteroid crashed into our planet. With that kind of force, it caused an explosion so powerful that part of our planet broke off and flew upward. This chunk of Earth remained in our planet's orbit, cooled and later formed into the moon we know today. Another surprise for the workers was the presence of gold. There was about 2.5 ounces of gold for every ton of soil lifted. The deeper the scientists went, the older the rocks were. In layers of rock about 2.8 billion years old, they found fossilized remains of living organisms. It made the world of science bubble with excitement as it meant that life on our planet appeared 1.5 billion years earlier than first thought. In the early 1990s, they shut down the drilling project. Gradually, the buildings around the borehole and the drilling equipment were lost. Today, a lot of tourists visit the place. It's because of those same myths about creatures from the underworld. Yes, there's a hole 7.5 miles deep under that rusty lid. But the scientists working there never reached their goal. 
They wanted to drill into the Earth's mantle, but to do that, they would have had to dig down to a depth of about 44 miles. At 200 feet per month, it would have taken as long as 80 years. That's assuming no accidents happened. But the deeper it goes, the more interesting it gets. A few years ago, they found a massive amount of water deep underground. Somewhere up to 370 miles down, there's a substantial ocean billions of years old. And the amount of water there is several times greater than in all the oceans, seas and rivers combined on the surface of Earth. The water there is at a scorching 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. But because it's under a tremendous pressure, it doesn't evaporate. It's encased in a crystalline structure of minerals. This ocean was formed in the early stages of our planet's development, when there was only hot lava and debris of space bodies around. But the most exciting thing you can find by drilling is living organisms. They've been there in isolation for billions of years and they can give us clues as to how life came into being in the first place. Scientists in Antarctica have created a similar borehole. An entire lake half the size of Lake Ontario was discovered under the thick ice. The amount of water in this lake is only 3.5 times less than in the Lake Baikal, the largest lake on Earth by volume. The ice that hides this lake is at least 20,000 years old, and the water beneath it has been isolated from the outside world for about 15 million years. While drilling, scientists lifted a chunk of ice from deep down below and found an unknown bacterium on it. Its genetic code was only 86% similar to known living organisms. That means that we've never seen bacteria like this before or it had come from outer space. But that's just a theory. We know that these bacteria can live in unusual conditions and at water temperatures below freezing. The composition of underground lake water is also different from what we're used to. There's a lot more oxygen and carbon dioxide in it. Add to these conditions complete isolation and we get living organisms that have developed and evolved in a completely different way. Do you understand what it means? The study of deep organisms may give us a clue as to whether life could exist beneath the ice on other planets or their moons. For example, Saturn's moon Enceladus has ice 24 miles thick. There may be an ocean underneath, which is heated by thermal springs. That's all for today. And guys, remember, let's become smarter every day together with Brightside. So you're swimming two miles down at the bottom of the ocean. Don't ask me how, just play along. It's cold and the pressure is intense. No fish in sight. Then you notice a green shiny thing. It's a cookie-cutter shark. Its neck glows in the dark to attract fish and other delicious treats. The shark doesn't look like much. It's small, about the size of a cat. It has brown skin and large green eyes. But looks can be deceiving. Every night, this creature rises to the surface and goes after great white sharks, whales, even swordfish. If you look closely, you'll see a round mouth with a bunch of sharp teeth in it. They don't just bite, they work kind of like a saw. This one's called a cookie-cutter shark because when it sees something delicious, it takes a cookie-shaped bite out of it. These sharks have even been known to disable submarines. Wonder what flavor they are. Our next shark is about the length of a car. Only about a hundred of these sharks have ever been seen. But if you met one, you'd never forget it. It has a big mouth, a huge mouth, a mega mouth, like me. It's the Mega Mouth Shark. You could easily fit in it if you curled yourself up. They're not dangerous, though. Well, not to humans. They feed by swimming around with their mouths open, filtering out plankton and other underwater goodies. The shark has special organs in its mouth that glow, attracting little crustaceans. It swims deep in the ocean in total darkness. 
Probably has a great smile, though. Thresher sharks also have a huge body part, the tail. It's almost half the length of the shark itself, and it looks like a helicopter blade. It's one of the few animals that hunts using its tail. The shark sneaks up on a school of fish and starts to shake its moneymaker. This freaks out some of the fish, which is exactly the plan. In a pinch, it can also use its tail to defend itself. The best thing about this shark? It doesn't attack people. The angel shark. There are quite a few types of angel shark out there, but they're more shark than angel. They're flat like stingrays, and their skin is covered with patterns that help them blend in with the seafloor. Because of this disguise, divers sometimes accidentally touch them, which isn't the best idea. They're fast and have powerful jaws. Still, they prefer the taste of small fish to you. The horn shark has two ridges that look like horns right above its eyes. It's definitely the grandpa of the shark world. Not aggressive, swims pretty slowly, and is up late almost every night. Its two favorite meals, sea urchins and crustaceans. It moves its fin on the seafloor almost as if it had paws. But don't underestimate this guy. It has one of the strongest bites of any shark. It needs those strong teeth to crush the shells of its late-night meals. And if something tries to attack it, watch out! Horn sharks have sharp spikes on their fins. The award for the ugliest shark goes to the goblin shark, and it's not even close. From the outside, it already looks kind of weird and is about the size of a pink underwater motorbike. It has a long tail and a seriously long nose. It lives way down in the depths of the ocean and loves to eat squid. It's not as fast as its relatives, but it's way more sneaky. It has a secret squid-catching technique, which is totally wild. The shark swims behind the squid. It's catching up, getting closer and closer. But the squid isn't slowing down, no way! It looks like the poor goblin shark won't have any lunch today. Then it opens its mouth. Its jaw is attached to folds of skin that mean it can literally throw its jaw out of its mouth. And it's a shark, so those teeth are sharp. That extra reach helps it grab its lunch, and when the meal's over, it pops its jaw back in its mouth. These sharks have been seen many times off the coast of Japan. They're actually named after the goblins in Japanese myths and fairy tales. There's only one thing out there cooler than a ninja shark. It's the ninja lantern shark. Imagine there's a tube you can slide down that takes you to the bottom of the ocean. It's too dark, you can't see anything. Suddenly, a glowing dot, moving around in the distance. It's coming closer, shooting towards you. It's a blue glowing head. Worse, it looks like this head doesn't have a body attached to it. The ninja lantern shark has black skin, so it's almost invisible in the dark. It's only the size of a human arm, but its small, sharp teeth are no joke. No one really knows why this shark glows. Maybe to attract tasty fish? Another theory out there is that it uses this light to communicate with its friends. It has friends? The hammerhead shark. These ferocious sharks can weigh up to half a ton. They live in tropical waters all over the world, and they're one of the most recognizable sharks out there. Their eyes really are located on the sides of their hammerhead. This means they can see in almost all directions. They even have special neck muscles to lift their head up and down just to see that little bit better. Their favorite food? Stingrays. You know, those flat things that swim along the seafloor, camouflage to look like sand and bits of rock. Stingrays get by by blending in with their surroundings. Danger mostly just swims by. But the hammerhead's eyes see everything. Uh-oh. Great white sharks, hammerheads, and other large sharks live for about 25 years. But one shark can live much, much longer. The Greenland shark can live anywhere from 300 to 500 years. It lives mostly in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. It loves to swim deep down where it's dark, so it uses its nose to sniff out food. Since it spends so much time down there, it's figured out how to withstand the strong pressure. It's one of the oldest living, largest, and slowest fish on Earth. Just imagine, you're on an Arctic cruise, and you see one of these sharks moving slowly through the freezing cold water. 
it might be 400 years older than you. Most sharks are omnivorous. They can go after dolphins, other sharks, crabs, sea urchins, smaller or even larger fish, hot dogs. Eh, kidding about the hot dogs. But the bonnethead shark is a bit different. It eats algae for about half its meals. It's actually related to the hammerhead shark, but its head looks more like a shovel. Can you dig it? If you see this guy swimming around, you might think it's a sea snake or a huge water worm. Frilled sharks like to swim way down at the bottom of the ocean, like a lot of sharks. When they're chasing something delicious, they move kind of like a snake. And just like a snake, they like to gulp down their lunch all in one piece. But that doesn't mean they don't have teeth. They have about 200 nice and sharp ones. The saw shark has a long, flat, and seriously spiky nose. Those teeth on its nose never stop growing. Each tooth is equipped with electric receptors to help the saw shark feel around for nearby fish, like a ship's radar. When dinner's nearby, the shark swims up and strikes with its nose, waving it around like a knight showing off his skills. Meanwhile, you won't have time to blink if this guy floats past. Did you see it? How about now? Meet the fastest shark in the world, the short fin mako shark. It can swim up to 35 miles per hour. That doesn't seem that quick on land, but underwater, that's fast. Slower than a cheetah, but faster than most dogs. It's warm-blooded, which is super rare for a shark. That helps it swim to cold and distant places where an ordinary shark simply wouldn't survive. The swordfish goes much faster. It can swim up to 60 miles per hour. It's not a shark, but it's still an amazing creature. In a race, the swordfish will usually come out on top. But it's not just fast, it's ingeniously fast. It has a gland next to its nose that pumps out a special oil. This oil spreads through its nose and comes out through tiny holes. This special oil is waterproof, which lets the swordfish glide through the water at high speed. Wanna high-five a sea creature? Well, put your flipper, I mean hand up, for the Tasmanian red handfish. This fish doesn't swim like a fish. It walks. It uses its flipper-like hands to stroll around on the ocean floor. These bottom walkers are disturbed by swimmers and boats a lot. Some people even want to take them home as pets. I think it's better to just give them a wave and swim on by. The Vampire Squid Its species name is Vampirotuthis infernalis, which translates to Vampire Squid from Hell. Oh yes, this vampire squid means to terrify everyone with its name. Its dark red color, its spikes at the bottom, and the scary fact that it can basically turn itself inside out. The vampire squid loves putting on a good show, but it's as harmless as a kitten is to humans. It's as if Dracula scared the pants off you, but he didn't have blood-sucking fangs. The vampire squid feeds on food particles from plants and animal matter floating near the ocean's surface. Since they're not predators, they need good defensive strategies, and their vampiric look is designed to ward off large creatures who want to eat them. Turning themselves inside out is a defensive mechanism since the spiky areas in the inner skin are more intimidating. They also shoot out a substance that does not have color, but is packed with bioluminescent particles to distract predators. The Vaquita Going out on a boat off the coast of Mexico sounds like the perfect vacation. The sun, the blue water, the most endangered sea creature. Wait, what? The vaquita isn't dangerous, but don't expect it to stick around to say hello or sign any autographs. It's incredibly shy. This little cow, that's what it means in Spanish, is one tiny sea mammal. With those black markings around its eyes, it looks more like a sea panda to me. Seeing one should make you feel very special. They're on the brink of extinction, mostly because they get caught by accident in fishing nets. It's estimated that there's only 10 left in the wild. The Blue Dragon This little creature looks like something out of a kid's fantasy movie. It's called the Blue Glaucus, casually referred to as the Blue Dragon or Blue Angel. It can be found in many places, the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. It's kind of a mollusk and it only grows to be about an inch long. What you think is the back is actually the mollusk's bright underbelly. 
It regularly floats on its back so that its blue colors help it camouflage with the water's waves. The blue dragon isn't just pretty, it's also smart. It usually feasts on Portuguese man o wars, also known as Fisalia fisalis. The blue dragon stores their stinging cells for later use, in essence, stealing their defensive mechanisms. When the blue dragon is threatened, it releases those stinging cells it stored, directing them at an enemy to sting them with more power than the Portuguese man o war would have been capable of. As they can store a huge amount of stinging cells, they can be a threat to humans. So, if you find one, don't pick it up. It's best to admire it from a distance. The Barrel Eye Fish If you ever wanted to have Superman's X-ray vision, looking at the Barrel Eye Fish will make you feel like you gained that superpower at some point in your life without even realizing it. The Barrel Eye has a transparent head, so you can see how their eyes and brain look inside. This magnificent creature lives in the deep sea. This is the lowest level of the ocean, where strange creatures roam in near-freezing temperatures and constant darkness. They're exposed to water's pressure that's almost 1,000 times that of the surface. If the idea of the deep sea sends a shiver down your spine, stay tuned to learn about another of its creatures later on. The barrel eye fish can be found in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. You might be wondering, why oh why would a fish have a see-through head? And that would be a fair question. Since the species was discovered in 1939, it was believed that the fish's eyes were set to see straight ahead and couldn't move. So it was assumed that they had tunnel vision. Scientists Bruce Robinson and Kim Reisenbickler from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute recently discovered that the fish can move its eyes vertically to see through the top of its translucent head, thus noticing if there are predators or a prey nearby. The transparent head also allows more light to enter so they can detect prey better. It's believed that the barrel eye fish eats jellyfish and small fish species. If you dive in the ocean at night, you might be lucky enough to see how orange ball coralomorph blooms in the dark. But make sure to be quick because as soon as you turn on your flashlight to take a good look, it will retract its tubes back into itself. The Megalodon the whale shark isn't the biggest shark known to humans. If the entire shark species were a kingdom, the prehistoric megalodon would be the ruler of the sea. Megalodon roamed the ocean a long time ago, oh, about 15.9 to 2.6 million years back between the early Miocene and late Pliocene eras. While they've long been extinct, people are still amazed to learn about these gigantic sea beasts. Megalodon could reach anywhere between 45 feet to 60 feet in length with jaws more than 6 feet wide. A fossil of a tooth that once belonged to a megalodon measured at 7 inches. Needless to say, I'm pretty stoked that these guys have long been extinct. But there's still some adventurers out there hoping to meet this monster one day. The Dumbo Octopus This adorable creature, or creepy creature, or however you want to see it, is officially called Grimpoteuthis. More casually, it's referred to as the Dumbo octopus named after the Disney character. Though Dumbo, the elephant, not the octopus, was teased for his big ears, it's highly unlikely that this adorable octopus gets teased by its water neighbors. They are the deepest living octopuses living in the deep sea, and you know how scary that place is. They're only about 8 inches tall and spend their days hovering just above the seafloor eating snails, worms, and other food they find in the current or near ocean vents. There are nearly 17 species of Dumbo octopus, and they all have differences in height, color, and body parts. If you can't get enough strange animals, you'll be glad to learn that the deep sea has barely been explored by humans. So, keep an eye out. There are bound to be more fascinating animals discovered in the deep in the future. The Sea Angel These creatures might look and sound pretty cute, but their diet is far from sunshine and lollipops. Their favorite food are sea butterflies. They lay mucus traps for them and wait in ambush. The Squat Anemone Shrimp This shrimp is tiny, only 0.5 inches. It's also known as a dancer shrimp because of its peculiar behavior. When agitated, it raises its bottom above its head and does a little dance. Divers also say it readily jumps on their hands and cleans them. The Coconut Crab This guy may look pretty creepy, especially when the sun goes down. Mature coconut crabs are around 3 feet in length. Their preferred foods are coconuts, 
but they can also hunt down lizards and even large birds. The Slender Snipe Eel Slender Snipe Eel is a slim and long creature that's still a mystery for marine scientists. It's 4 feet long, and it has at least 750 bones in its spine, which is much more than any other animal in the world. The Sea Pen Sea pen is 7 feet long and it has a lot of varieties, but most of them look indeed like a pen or a quill. The similarity is even more striking when the animal has a water-filled bulb that anchors it to the floor. The Persian Carpet Flatworm This creature looks indeed like a carpet, despite being very small by comparison. It's only 4 inches long, able to become both male and female. It doesn't really mate with other flatworms. Rather, it fights them for the right to bear posterity. The Flamingo Tongue Sea Snails Tourists love these extraordinary snails for their pretty colors, thinking it's a shell, but in fact, the shell is quite dull and hidden underneath colorful soft tissues. They eat softer, toxic parts of corals and store their toxins to protect themselves. Most of the ocean is still shrouded in mystery whether we're talking about dark corners or creatures that are hiding in the depths. But sometimes, it gives us a peek into scary things it hides in its cold, dark depths. Like when you hear on the news that there are some deep sea creatures washed ashore after a powerful storm once again. Some just look weird, while others are real monsters that live at depths of more than 3,300 feet. The coldest and deepest parts of the ocean have created one specific phenomenon called gigantism. So, sea spiders, squids, worms, and many other animals, mostly invertebrates or creatures without backbones, they are all way bigger and scarier than the versions we see in the more shallow areas. In the Pacific depths, you can see a sea sponge as large as a minivan. Or what about the colossal squid that lives in sub-Antarctic waters and is nearly 14 times longer than the arrow squid, a type that mostly lives in New Zealand? Researchers found many of these underwater monsters in the abyssal zone of the ocean. Back in 2021, the researchers showed images of the giant phantom jelly. It was at a depth of 3,200 feet. Its tentacles were 33 feet long. Wow, I wouldn't like to face that one on the beach. It probably eats only small fish and plankton, but it can swim to depths of more than 21,900 feet. And down there, this giant jelly doesn't have enough food. How does it survive then? Scientists haven't figured it out yet. And there are even more questions related to the giant squid, the biggest one ever found. This monster is 43 feet long with a weight of nearly a ton. Imagine if those tentacles would grab your car, or something like that. They would smash it like it was a toy. There's no light in the abyssal zone. Sun rays just can't penetrate that deep. So there's no algae or underwater plants there. Local animals mostly eat snow. Marine snow is not like the regular one you build a snowman with. It consists of any small flakes or remains that fall from the surface of the ocean maybe even some leftovers that animals up there couldn't eat. So it's not much, but apparently it's enough for very large creatures that hide deep down there, like giant squids. Squids that generally live at such depths don't bother going after their prey. They just wait until the poor animal swims right up to their long tentacles and falls into a trap. It may not be the best method ever because not many animals will even swim into these dark cold parts but it's the method that saves energy. A giant squid eats only one ounce of fish daily, which is approximately 45 calories. That's nearly 50 times fewer calories than an average person should eat per day. So when a squid gets one fish, it saves it for a couple of days. I hope giant squids won't get the idea to go to the surface and look for food when there's not enough of it in the abyssal zone. And I hope even more that giant Greenland sharks won't get that same idea. You can find them at depths of up to 7,200 feet. They're twice as slow as we usually walk. They swim at a speed of 1.12 feet per second. Their slowness is part of the energy saving mechanism that creatures down there need to survive. But they can speed up in the form of short bursts when they need to catch prey but they kind of changed their diet from predator to scavenger 
considering their environment. There will be more leftovers falling from the surface than animals to go after. Greenland sharks grow just 0.4 inches per year, and they're mostly 20 feet long, which means they live for a very long time, sometimes up to 400 years. They also have a slow metabolism, and that's one of the main factors for their long life, too. Greenland sharks like to spend their time in cold waters. They're adapted to that since their tissues have specific chemical compounds that prevent the forming of ice crystals all over their body. That means they have some sort of natural antifreeze. So what makes them so big? Scientists are still not sure, but some theories try to explain it. There's this thing called Kleiber's rule that says bigger animals tend to be more efficient. Just take a small fish and compare it to a whale with a mass hundreds of times bigger. The whale has a greater metabolism. It conserves energy more efficiently and loses less of it to the surroundings through heat. Moving on, bigger animals can ingest bigger prey. They're more likely to go through tough issues in their environment or defend themselves from predators going after them. Also, the body gets bigger when temperatures are lower. The Greenland shark is a perfect example. So are giant sea spiders. Sea spiders are generally common, and you find some very small ones at 0.04 inches. But in deeper parts of the Antarctic, they become three-foot-long giants. They grow so big because the cold water has more oxygen. That way, more of it diffuses into the animal's body, and that allows it to grow bigger. Yeah, both as a creature and a nightmare. And how about this giant tube worm? Researchers found it accidentally while they were exploring the mysteries of the Pacific Ocean floor. They stumbled upon unusual hydrothermal vents. Volcanic heat is a thing that gets them going. As water seeps down through faults or cracks in the rock, these vents change their direction. When the water gets out of the vent, it's rich in different minerals and chemicals. Most animals wouldn't survive being around this toxic soup of chemicals, but not these tube worms. They came as a true surprise, because not only are they not bothered by these toxic vents and the almost boiling temperature of the water, but they developed entire ecosystems there. They're unique because they don't need sunlight to survive. Instead, small bacteria are their main source of energy. That bacteria gets their energy directly from these toxic chemicals. So it's not photosynthesis, but a process called chemosynthesis. And these tube worms don't have mouths. These bacteria live inside them. Strange story, huh? Plus, these scary worms reach up to eight feet. Giant isopods are no better either. They lurk at the depths of the ocean of 1,640 feet or more below, far away from the sunlight, looking like some monstrous wood lice. They spend most of their time on the seabed, hoping to find some food falling from higher levels of the ocean. Check out their small hooked claws at the ends of their legs. Isopods use them to remain more stable while moving around the ocean floor. Since there's no light, they have long antennae that help them feel their way around. These sensory antennas are about half the length of their body. Giant isopods have pretty big eyes compared to their body size too. They can grow over 12 inches from head to tail. And these fellas are really patient. Remember how we said animals down there rarely get food? Sometimes they need to wait for years to get a proper meal. That's why their metabolism is amazingly slow. Five years later. They can go for five years without eating anything. Imagine that. I get hungry just talking about this. In 2006, a biologist did research to compare the differences between the shallows and the deep sea regions. He realized the deep sea mirrors the island rule. First, isolated parts of land develop biodiversity you won't find anywhere else. Second, small-bodied life there grows much bigger when it's isolated, compared to life on large land masses. Resources are limited, but also competition and predators. And we don't know much about these deep sea creatures. It's too expensive and too complicated to carry out such research. So we'll just wait for more raging storms to show us at least part of the monstrous world cold ocean depths hide. 
that's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.